We are finally beginning the Talmud, Masechet Barachot. Shekhyanu v'kimanu v'giyanu l'zman hazeh. I'm so excited for this, Baruch Hashem. I will tell you that preparing these shiurim have been a challenge. For the very simple reason that I am used to I'm used to studying Talmud very differently than the way we study Talmud when we learn Agadah. I'm used to studying Talmud the way you would study Talmud when you're studying Halakha. But now we're trying intentionally not to study the Talmud the way we would study it for Halakha. We're instead trying to study Talmud in the fashion in which we would study Agadah. And that means that it's going to be a learning curve for all of us. There are certain things we're going to reach in the Talmud that we will have a yetzah, I'm not going to call it yetzah, but an inclination to go uh, discuss those topics in halakha. But really the framework of this shi'ul is not going to be focusing on the details of halakha. But we have enough shi'ul throughout the week to do that. Rather, we're going to be pushing ourselves to try to understand the words of Agadah that are found inside of the Talmud. That doesn't mean, though, that when we study the Talmud, we will not study it accurately. And I think that that's a mistake that many people make when they study Talmud, and they're trying to take lessons of Agadah from the Talmud. As much as they're trying to avoid Halakha, Halakha you can avoid when you study Talmud. What you cannot avoid is proper reading of the Talmud. What does the Talmud actually say? What does the text actually say? What do the words actually mean? And therefore, before we can even delve into a deeper understanding of the words of the Talmud, we first have to ensure, guarantee, that we study, uh, understand the words of the Talmud in the first place. There are a few different books that you could use for the shiur. So first off, it's very easy to just use safaria.org. The the first page of Masechet Berachot, you would go safaria, Talmud, Berachot, even page 2a. Some of you will be using a regular Talmud, a regular Gemara, uh, which is fine. That that could be something as plain as a regular Hebrew Vilna Shas from any printing press of your choice. It could be the Art Scroll, it could be the Koran, it could be whatever else it is. All of those are a Vilna Talmud. Also, uh, uh, the ones in Spanish that come from Tashma, those are all the Vilna Talmud. You have, on the other hand, also an opportunity to use a book like En Yaakov, which is what is in front of me right now. Uh, and that is similar in... in style, meaning again the Talmud is in the middle and the commentary is on the side, but the commentaries surrounding the page of the Yaakov are completely different than those which are found in the Talmud itself. So if you look at the files that I shared earlier today, you'll have a file called En Yaakov and it will say sections 1 to 6. The En Yaakov is broken down not in page numbers, but rather in sections. If you remember Rabbi Yaakov ben Chabit, when he was making his En Yaakov, he was trying to uh, organize them in a certain fashion. Today we just have it in the order of the Talmud, but the idea was to have chapters uh, instead of page numbers in the Talmud. You then have the Vilna edition, which I also attached to the classroom. We're going to need both because sometimes we're going to jump back and forth between commentaries or wordings or formats that are found in both of those uh, different editions of the Talmud. And I've attached that to the Google Classroom as well. So you'll see on the second attachment is going to be the the Vilna, I don't want to call it the Talmud Bavli, Vilna edition, uh, page 2a and b to 3a and b. That's going to be two dapim from the Talmud Bavli. Does everyone have a Talmud in front of them, something in front of them? Yeah, okay, good. Bon Hashem. So my plan for today is to read the first Mishnah of Masech Berachot, understand what it really means, build a few ideas from it, and then, God willing, pave the way for next week's shiur, and the shiurim, which will inevitably take place after the Chagim, to delve into deeper ideas of this section of the Talmud. It's a little worrisome to me that we're starting right now and that we're not starting right after Sukkot. The reason being that we're going to get right into the Sugya and then take about a month break. 
And I'm concerned about that. I am, I'm not going to lie to you. I was thinking of, maybe I'll do a few more introductions until Rosh Hashanah, but I said, if I do more than 15 introductions to En Yaakov, then uh, I'm, I'm sure people are going to start saying, what is this Ashiu of introductions? Just name it something else. So I decided we're going to jump into the Mishnah. But what I'm asking from you, and for if you're learning with me live now, or you're learning with us on the, on the internet through YouTube, to make sure that you know this Mishnah like the back of your head. We're going to take apart things in this Mishnah, words in this Mishnah, ideas in this Mishnah, and I need you to be able to, even when you're walking in the street, even when you're going to bed at night, to be able to think about this Mishnah. You should be able to know, if not word for word, then at least the very idea of the Mishnah. How did it start? How, who, how did it, uh, uh, who speaks inside of it? What does it say inside of it? What is the back and forth inside of it? And so too any other piece of Talmud that we study, it's crucial that when we study it, we make sure that we really know it, we own it. Uh, when I was in yeshiva, there were many times, not by Havah Pehvetz, there were many times that people would come to the shiur and they would study Talmud, and the rabbi had assumed, assumed, that everybody in the shiur had already studied the Talmud, and now it was just a bunch of commentaries. And as nice of an assumption as that is, there are two flaws in that system. The first is a regular flaw, and the second is a uniquely uh, Sephardic understanding of that flawed system. The first, it's highly unlikely that all the people in your shiul are even knowing what you're talking about. You think everyone does their homework? Do I think that everyone prepared properly for tonight's shiul? Probably not. Everyone is busy. Everybody has a life. Everybody has things going on with them. Hopefully by next week, that'll be different. But to assume that people have already laid the groundwork and the foundations, and now you could just build a 20-story building on top of it, it's not fair. It's not, it's not correct. And it's a mistake. And in any case, even if we weren't to delve a whole shiul in this Mishnah, it would be important for us to read it together at least once. The second... The second is a special understanding of how Sephardic Yeshivot, I can speak at least for the communities that I'm familiar with, in particular North Africa and in Yemen as well. In those Yeshivot, there was a completely different style of study than what we're familiar with in our Eurocentric Yeshiva world today. And that is that in the Yeshivot of Sephardad, there was very little of what we call Chavruta time. So I'll give you an example in a regular Yeshiva that you'll find in the world today. Uh, yeshiva students will finish eating breakfast after praying. They'll go to the Bet Midrash. I'll give you an example, and they'll they'll be told that they should study this first Mishnah in with their study partner from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. So they spend three hours studying the sugya, whatever they need to study. Maybe they'll tell them, look up at this commentary, look up that commentary, and they'll study and they'll prepare and they'll prepare and they'll prepare. Then they walk into a shiul from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock in which the rabbi gives some fascinating explanation of little details of the sugya, in whichever fashion that, that Chacham usually speaks. At 1 p.m. everyone takes a break, and at about 3 p.m. until 7 p.m. everybody reviews everything they studied in that one hour of the shiur. So in one given day of yeshiva, how much time is actually spent studying with a Chacham? Yeah, an hour, mamash an hour. The rest of the day, you're studying with an amateur, just like yourself. So when I'm going to, to learn the sugya, to know the sugya, if I spend three hours learning the sugya on my own, breaking my teeth on the wording on my own, the pronunciation on my own, the definitions, the translations on my own, there's a tremendous chance that by the time I reach 12 o'clock, not only did I make some mistakes, but now those mistakes are so deeply ingrained in me because I owned those mistakes. I learned those mistakes. Now I come to Eshua at 12 o'clock. But the Chacham, he already assumes you learned the Talmud. So what does he do? He doesn't bother teaching you what it says. Rather, now he's going to build a building on top of what? On top of your mistake. And then you have a building that looks kind of like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It's, uh, it's crooked because over here you made a mistake and then you built a, a whole tower on top of it. And then what happens? It'll fall apart eventually. So this... This style of learning Torah is very dangerous. In the world of Sefarad, the Chacham would sit, imagine I'm sitting now, everyone would sit around the table of the Chacham, or in a circle around the Chacham, and from the morning until the night, the Chacham is reading texts with the students. So the Mishnah, so there could be two different styles. Either the Chacham reads the Mishnah, explains and asks questions while he's reading the Mishnah, or what would happen is that each student would have an opportunity to read, the Chacham would interrupt. Hey, that was mispronounced. Oh, that's not the correct translation. What does that word mean? To explain. And the whole room. There's no time to learn a mistake. You can't make a mistake. You're sitting in front of someone who's teaching you what needs to be taught. 
and you learn the whole day. So the whole day, you can easily, if you learn like that, it's not one hour a day of Shi'uim. It's 12 hours a day of Shi'uim. Of course you finish the Tanakh. Of course you finish all of Mishnayot and Talmud and Shulchan Aruch. Why? Because the Chacham who's teaching you has woven everything together for you. This style of Limut Torah is almost, not impossible, almost impossible to find in the world today. And I keep thinking of the words of Rabbi Yosef Kapach. I'm all for adopting Minhagim. Rabbi Yosef Kapach was saying, I'm liberal about this idea. Let's take Minhagim from other people. Nice Minhagim, good Minhagim. But why on earth have we replaced superior Minhagim with inferior Minhagim? That question we don't have an answer to. Why would we change a superior method of Limut Torah with an, a highly inferior method of Limut Torah? So today we'll try to do both. And I want to do today the first Mishnah of Masechet Berachot as I understood it, as I, as I read it, as I uh, looked in the different Mepharshim that explained it and clarified it. And I wish to do that to do together today with you. In Bezat Hashem, when we lay this groundwork, so really next week we can start asking some of the questions that we need to ask to walk away with deeper lessons of Agadah from them. Look with me on the first page of Masechet Berachot, whether you're in the Talmud Bavli or you're in the En Yaakov, it's going to be on the top of the page. Me'ematai, from when? Korin et Shema Ba'aravin. From when do you read Shema in the evening? By the way, there are two ways to pronounce that word. Either Ba'aravin or Be'arvin, like here, like it says here. Now, if I'm not mistaken... That this Be'arvin and Ba'aravin is going to be dependent on something else, which I'll talk to you about later, in just a moment. But the way that I've always read this Mishnah, Me'matai korin et Shema Ba'aravin. When do we begin to read Shema in the evening? Say the Chachamim. Misha'a sha'kohanim nichnasin le'chol bitrumatan. We begin to say Shema in the evening from the moment in which the Kohanim begin to eat their Tiruma. What is Tiruma? What is Tawma? It's the, the food you eat for, it's the special food for the Kohanim that we set aside. It's a special food that the Kohanim eat. The Kohanim eat, very good. What? I'll put that one moment. Okay. Welcome to those who just joined us. Mechila, that I didn't send out the invitation uh, via Google Classroom. I see that I didn't send on my end. Um, I apologize. You didn't miss anything aside from an introduction to my uh, shi'ur today. So, Bezad Hashem, that introduction will go online. But we have not yet started reading the Mishnah. We're going to start again together right now. We are in the first Mishnah, Maser Berchot. Mematai korin et Shema Ba'aravin. From when do we read the Shema in the evening? So when we say Shema, we mean the prayer of Shema Yisrael. And the Mishnah tells us, Misha'a sha'kohanim nichnasin le'chol bitumatan. From the moment in which the Kohanim enter to eat their Tiruma. What is Tiruma? Somebody give me a definition of Tiruma. Very good. It's food that only Kohanim can eat. Yes? So a regular person like us can't eat Tehumah, but a Kohen can eat Tehumah. So from when the Kohanim enter to eat their Tehumah? Until when? Ad sof ha'ashmorah harishona. Until the end of the first Ashmura, or in Hebrew, Mishmeret. Until the end of the first watch. What is a watch? Let me explain a little outside now, superficially, and we're going to analyze these words in just a minute again together. So the Kohanim enter to eat their Tehumah. Let's say something happens to a Kohen. So a Kohen is impure. So a Kohen has to wait seven days and afterwards goes to the Mikveh. And in order to be able to eat Tehumah, the Kohen has to wait for two things. Both for the, the sun to set and the three stars to come out, meaning for the day to end. Yes, so that now... The, day, the seven days are over, as well as the second thing, which is he has to go to the mikveh. Now, he can go to the mikveh earlier, right before sunset, but until the sun sets, 
the Kohen is unable to enter and eat his Tawma. So really when Chachamim say, Misha'asha Kohanim Nechnasin Nechol B'Tumatan, from the moment in which the Kohanim are able to enter and eat their Tawma, really that's just saying from when three stars come out. Yes? So you can begin saying Shema Yisrael from Tzet HaKochavim, from when the three stars emerge. That's when Shabbat ends, that's when the nighttime begins, that's after sunset, the three stars come out, that's when a, a, a person can begin to say Shema Yisrael. Yes, so from when do we begin? From the moment in which the Kohanim are able to enter and eat their Tawmah. Until when? Until the end of the first watch. I'll explain in just a moment what is a watch. In, in the end Yaakov, there are brackets here because it seems like Yaakov ben Khabib stopped here. He didn't continue with the rest of the opinions, but we'll do the whole Mishnah together. And that's what's printed anyways in the rest of the books that we have. Divrei Rabbi Eliezer. So Rabbi Eliezer says, until when can you say the Shema? Until the end of the first watch. We're going to understand just a moment what is the first watch. By the way, there is a small machloket among different Chachamim, whether or not the whole thing until now has been the words of Rabbi Eliezer. Meaning, did he say from when three stars come out until the end of the first watch? Or is he only saying, everybody agrees, everybody says from when three stars come out, and only Rabbi Eliezer is adding, Ad Sof HaShmura until the end of the first watch. V'chachamim omrim, Ad Chatzot. A rabbi say until midnight. When is midnight? Halachik midnight. Rabban Gamliel omer, and Rabban Gamliel says, until the pillar of dawn rises, meaning until dawn. So now let's back up for a moment. Let's speak this Mishnah out without looking at the words here. When can one begin to say Shema in the evening? From when the Kohanim enter to eat their Tawma. What time of day is that? Tzedek Kohavim. Very good. When three stars come out. Until when? Until when? There's a three-way machaloket here. Three-way argument. What's the machaloket? Rabbi Eliezer says, you can say Shema Yisrael up until... No, until... The end of the first watch. Ad sof ha harishona. Let's argue, just for the sake of tonight, that it's the first third of the night. Yes? So if you were to split up from when three stars come out until the morning, you would split that up into 12 parts. So this would be until the end of the first third. The Chachamim Amrim, what do Chachamim say? Until when can you say Shema? Later than that. What's later than that? Chatzot. Until midnight. So Rabbi Eliezer says for the first third of the night. Chachamim say until midnight, the first half of the night. And Rabban Gamliel says, Literally until the next morning. You can say Shema Yisrael until it becomes tomorrow. You can say the evening Shema the whole evening. When the evening ends? When the day begins. When does the day begin? When Amud HaShachah, when the dawn begins. This is a, this is a three-way machloket between Rabbi Yezah, Chachamim, and Rabban Gamliel. Now as much as in Halakha, this will become an argument. There are also teachings here of Chachmei HaAgadah that try to explain what is at the root of this Machalogan. Not for tonight. For now, we're just going to understand this Mishnah this way. We're going to finish reading the Mishnah. We're going to go through Rashi and some selected commentaries. And with Allah Hashem, we're going to make sure that we understand this Mishnah. The Mishnah is waterproof. We understand everything we need to know in this Mishnah so that we can begin to build our building on top of it with Allah Hashem next week. Maser, so here's the story. Uvau banav mi bet There's a story that the sons of Rabban Gamliel, they came home from a bet hamishteh. Bet hamishteh is a place where people drink. Bet hamishteh, the house of drinking. They were minastam, the Rabban says at a wedding. Amruno, they tell him, who's him? Rabban Gamliel. So the sons of Rabban Gamliel were at a wedding. They come home and they tell him, Lo karinu et shema. We didn't read Shema yet. We forgot. Amar lehem, he tells them, Im lo ala amud hashachar, 
חייבים אתם לקרות. So long as the dawn has not begun, the Amud HaShachar, the pillar of dawn has not risen, you are still obligated to read Kriyat Shema. Essentially, what are the children asking Rabban Gamliel? They clearly were at a wedding, they came home late. Most likely, it was past midnight. What are they really asking their father? They can rely on his opinion against the Hamim. Very good. Can we rely on your opinion? That you could say Shema until the morning. When the Chachamim have already ruled that after midnight your time is over. And he says, yes, so long as it is not turned on, you have an obligation to read Kirat Shema. Velozo bilvadamu. And not only that, every time you see the Chachamim use the words, Ad Chatzot, that you can only do something until midnight. Mitzvatan ad shi'aleh amud ha-shachar. The mitzvah is, Ad shi'aleh amud ha-shachar, until dawn. So Chachamim, whenever they tell you you only have until midnight, you should know that really, really, you have until when? Until dawn. Until amud ha-shachar. Says Rabban Gamliel, so yeah, Right now, you're past midnight, but even the Chachamim, it's not just you can rely on me, even the Chachamim would agree that you're still obligated in saying Shema. Now he says something else. Hekter chalavim ve'evarim. What are chalavim ve'evarim? Very good. There's all kinds of organs and fats that have to be burned in the Bet HaMikdash. So the burning, hekter, ktoret, yeah, to offer, the offerings, the burned offerings of the chelet and the evarim, of the fat and the body parts. Mitzvatan ad The mitzvah is to do them until dawn. V'chol anechalim liyom echad. Also, here, all those that have to be eaten in one day, there are certain korbanot, you have to eat them in one day, all those you have up until dawn to eat them. You can, therefore, if, if so, if this is true, that the Chachamim always agree that you have until dawn, Lama amru Chachamim ad chatzot. Why did the Chachamim tell us that we can say Shema Yisrael only until midnight? Meaning, if they agree that you have until the morning, why did they say that you only have until midnight. Says the Mishnah, Kedei l'achik adam min ha'avira. In order to distance people from doing averot. What does that mean? If I know that I have until dawn and I forget, so what happens then? Nothing. There's nothing I can do. It's already over. But if Chachamim tell me you have until Chatzot, and I forget, oh, don't worry. Chatzot is when you're ideally supposed to do it. But you really have until the morning. Chachamim here made a fence, a protective barrier, to make sure that people wouldn't get too close to missing the mitzvah. Instead, they put the line all the way over here, so that if somebody would pass it, they're still within the boundaries of halacha. This Mishnah, aside from having important conversations about Shema, and what is Shema, why is Shema, also is going to be in the first example, really, of our rabbis exercising their authority to tell you one thing in order to help you avoid doing Avilot. So walk me through the Mishnah again. It's going to be coming out of your ears by the time we're done. When, from when do we begin to read Shema in the evening? When do we begin, according to everyone? When do we begin to say Shema? Say the Kochavim. What does the Mishnah really say? From when the Kohanim enter to eat their Tehuma, which is very good, say the Kochavim, which is when three stars come out. But it's important in this phrase of when the Kohanim enter to eat their Tehuma. And then until when? According to Rabbi Eliezer, the first third of the night. What is the first third of the night? At Sof Hashmoah Rishona. Until the first third. The second opinion is that of Chachamim, the majority of the sages of Israel. Chachamim Amorim Ad Chatzot. Until midnight. By the way, how do you know when midnight is? It's the middle of the night. You don't have a clock. How do you know when midnight is? 
You have a clock, but you don't need to have a sign when you have. How do you know when it's midnight? Right. It's a very easy way to calculate. It's a good way. It's a good thing to know. You can practice it. Whenever I walk home with my family after a bit of Knesset on Shabbat morning, I haven't done it in a while, I always tell them how to calculate Chatzot. Chatzot is when the sun is right above your head. Hashem is kofachat an rosho. It's glaring down on your head. In the, in the way in which you don't have a shadow, it's right on top of you. That's how you know it's midday. So you look at your watch, that's 12.31, so you know that tonight at 12.31 a.m. is going to be halachic midnight. Exactly 12 hours after halachic midday, which you can measure on your own, you can know when is going to be halachic midnight. So that's how you know until, for Chachamim, until when you can say Shema Yisrael. Rabban Gamliel says, you really have all the way until the morning. So what's the story? Rabban Gamliel's sons go to a, a wedding. And they come back home late, and clearly they've missed Chatzot. Now they ask their father, can we still say Shema? Or are we still obligated? Meaning, have we missed out on doing the mitzvah? And he tells them two things. The first, yes you can. But not only according to me, this is thing two. Any time you see the Chachamim tell you that you have only until midnight, you must know that you really have until the morning. So why did Chachamim choose to say until midnight when really you have until the morning? Remember this line, adam In order to distance people from doing Averot. Here ends the first Mishnah of the entire Mishnayot of Masech and Berachot. Let's look at Rashi. If you have an En Yaakov, Rashi is going to be the top two columns in your book. So if you're looking at the PDF that I sent out of En Yaakov, Rashi is on both sides and he's conveniently labeled. If you're in a Talmud and you're looking at the real page of the Talmud, Rashi is always going to be the commentary that's on the innermost side of the page. So whatever is closest to the binding of the book, the other side of the book is going to be Tosafot, except for some Masechtot where he's not there. And Rashi is always going to be in the middle of the page. So if you're looking at a page on your right side, Rashi will be on the left. And if you're looking at a page on your left side, Rashi will be on the right. Does that make sense? Everyone knows where to find Rashi? Now for the most part, Rashi is writing here, it's always printed in Rashi's script. Why? I don't know. I don't know why this font is still in, in fashion. If it was up to me, we'd put it out of business a long time ago. Not because we, we shouldn't know how to read it, just because a lot of people have a hard time reading it. And because of that, why leave it there? You know, Rashi, I don't even know if Rashi wrote in this style. This is not named Ktav Rashi because Rashi used it. It's called Ktav Rashi because normally in the books, this is before fancy laser printing presses and those kind of things. You had to show what was the Chumash and what was Rashi. What, what's the text of the Talmud and what is Rashi. How do you do it? By using two different fonts. Because of that, you now have a Talmud that's written. They call it Ktav Rashi. But really, there's a hundred commentaries here that are using Ktav Rashi. Because it's not a Rashi script. And why they call it that, I still don't know. But it's a script in which they used to print the writings of Rashi. Nonetheless, let's do the first, the first Rashi here. From when do we read Shema in the evening? From when the Kohanim enter to eat their Tehumah. So Rashi explains, phrase by phrase, what it is that we read. What does it mean from when the Kohanim enter to eat their Tehumah? These are Kohanim who became impure in some way. And they immerse themselves. Shimshan, and it became evening, meaning literally their sun set. Vigia itam lechol batuma, and it became their their et, their time to eat tuma. Ad sof hashmura rishona. So on this time, you can read Shema up until the first watch. What are watches? Shlish halayla. It's the third of the night. Knefaresh Bagmara, like the Gemara explains on page 3a. 
ומשם ואילך, and from there on, עבר זמן, זה לא מקרה טו זמן שכיבה. It's no longer called the time of going to sleep. Let's, let's do this together. From where do we know that you have to read Shema Yisrael in the first place? The Gemara is going to ask this question, but I can't wait until they're to ask you this question. I mean, the first question of the Mishnah is, from when do you read Shema in the evening? Who says you have to read Shema in the first place? Where does it say that? Where does the Torah command you to read Shema, Rabotai? You say it at least twice a day, if not three times a day. Very good. In Shema Yisrael, we say, you have to read Shema when? B'shoch b'cha, when you lay down. Uv kumecha, and when you get up. Those are the two times in which you have to read Shema. By the way, if the Torah would have just said, Baboker uh, uva'erev, uh, in the morning and the evening, then we would, this whole Mishnah wouldn't exist. But the, the Torah says, you have to say Shema when you go to sleep, and when you wake up in the morning. The first question, Chachamim, need to know, what is considered go, the, uh, b'shoch b'cha, going to bed? What does it mean when you lay in bed? I, can, I have to say Shema when I lay in bed. What time of day is that? So according to Rabbi Eliezer, after the first third of the night, lo mikre tu zman shkiva. It's no longer called zman shkiva b'shoch b'cha. It's no longer a time in which people are going to sleep. Velo karinen be b'shoch b'cha. You can't say about that time that it's b'shoch b'cha when I'm going laying in bed. Umekame hache and before this. It's also not time of going to sleep. So you can't read Shema before when the three stars come out. Why? Because nobody's going to sleep then. Somebody who reads Shema Yisrael before three stars come out did not fulfill their obligation. Let's pause here because before we make a mess, and Rashi takes us onto what Jewish people do in synagogues for Avid, before we jump into any of that, let's first understand what Rashi is telling us. The argument between the Chachamim is, is dependent on how you interpret the word Beshoch Becha. We're talking about nighttime Shema. We're not talking about daytime Shema. And we know that the Shema of the night has to be said in the time in which we are Beshoch Becha, that we are laying in bed. Let's read the Mishnah this way. Rabbi Eliezer says, that you read Shema from Tzedek Chavim and not earlier. Why? Why? Everyone says, because earlier than Tzedek Chavim, before three stars come out, is not called a time of Bishoch Becha. And it's not late enough yet. People don't go to bed yet. The next. Rabbi Rezer says, so until when can I say Shema? Meaning, when does the time of Bishoch Becha end? When people stop going to sleep. People sleep all the way to the morning, No. But according to Rabbi Eliezer, Bishoch Becha is not when you're laying in bed. It's when you're going to bed. Because of this, you only have the first third of the night. Chachamim say until midnight, but we know the Chachamim and Rabban Gamliel really agree with each other. So what's Rabban Gamliel's opinion and the Chachamim's opinion? Why can you say Shema Yisrael up until dawn? What happens at dawn? Yeah, people start waking up. Because people start waking up, you can no longer call that time of day the time of Bishoch Becha. That's now a time, Uf Kumecha, that's the time of getting up. So the argument here is dependent on whether or not you can call the time after three hours the time of Bishoch Becha or not. And Rabbi Leah says, no, you can't. Once people have already gone to sleep, you no longer can say Shema Yisrael. The arguing opinion says, no, you can say until the morning, meaning until people wake up. Everyone's following me so far? Yes. Yes. Rashi now asks an interesting question, which I have such an inclination to get into one day, but that's for Halakha Shiur. Says Rashi, Imken, if this is true, that you can't read Shema Yisrael before three stars come out, Lama korinotah beveta knesset? Why do we read Shema Yisrael 
in the Beda Knesset, in Arvit. Arvit, we pray sometimes, imagine a Friday night, we pray Arvit before it gets dark outside. So why do we read it then? Says Rashi, Kedei la'amod batfila mitoch divrei Torah. In order to stand up into tefila, into your Amidah, by first saying words of Torah. That's the reason. Before you want to pray, you want to say words from the Torah. Now, this is going to set Tosafot off. If you're using a regular Shas, look in the left column, you're going to see some monster Tosafot commentary. That's because Tosafot loses. How, how could it be that you're saying that's the reason why we say Shema in the evening? We'll get to that. That's what it says in the Beraita. Bivrachot Yerushalmi, in Masechet Yerushalmi. We have an obligation to read Shema Yisrael from when it gets dark. According to Rashi, if you read Shema Yisrael early in the night, before three stars come out, you did not fulfill your obligation saying Shema. The only reason you read Shema Yisrael at that time was in order to... Have a learn with me. Someone, uh, take off your microphone. Don't be afraid. Learn with me. Why did you say Shema Yisrael before three stars came out? Because you want to stand up into your Amidah while first saying words from the Torah. That's the value that it had to say Shema Yisrael before three stars came out. But of course... We have an obligation, says Rashi, to read Shema when it gets dark. And then Rashi says something interesting. So now you finished, you prayed Arvit early, you go home, it's Friday night, you did Kiddush, you finished Brakal Mazon, now you're about to go to bed. What part of Shema Yisrael do you say before you go to bed? At least in the olden days. I know today everybody became a Kabbalist. What happened, what do you read in the olden days? The first paragraph of Shema Yisrael. The first paragraph. Says Rashi, with the first paragraph of Shema Yisrael that you read at night before you go to bed, you fulfill your obligation of saying Shema Yisrael at night for Arvit. The commentaries here, like Tosavot, they jump on him. I'm obligated to read the whole Shema. You're telling me that now the Shema Yisrael that I'm reading for an entirely different reason at night when I go to bed, and I'm only reading the first paragraph of it, that's going to work for what I, I missed before, what I said at the wrong time before? I would love to jump down this rabbit hole with you, but I can't, because we're in a shiur of Agadah, not in a shiur of Halakha. Now if you would like, and you have more hours in your life, and you wish to maybe parallel to the shiur, make an optional, uh, another shiur, I am here, I have time, of Halakha from the Talmud, you're welcome to jump down that rabbit hole with me. But for right now, we've got to stick to the realm of Agadah. Let's keep running through Rashi. Says Rashi, Achi ale Amud Shachar. You can say Shema according to Rabban Gamliel until Amud Shachar, till dawn. Shekol halayla karu zman shkiva. Because according to Rabban Gamliel, the whole night is called zman shkiva, a time of bishoch becha, of going to bed. The sacrificing of the blood and the, uh, the, the fats and the body parts of sacrifices whose blood was done zrika to them that day. Mitzvatan, their obligation, lalotan kol alayla. You can offer them the whole night. Ve'enan nifsalim balina ad she'alei amud ha'shachar. Ve'en amatam nizbeach, dikhtiv, lo yalin l'boker. Did they only become problematic once dawn rises. But until dawn, the whole night you can offer these fats. Chalavim. What chalavim? Which fats do we offer? Shel korbanot. Of the sacrifices. Evarim. The limbs of shel ola. Of the ola offering. V'chol anechalim liyom echad. And all those sacrifices which we must eat in one day. Kegon chatat. V'asham. Kifsei atzeret. Umnachot. V'todah. All of those offerings must be eaten in one day. We're not really going to get stuck on Kobanot at all, so there's no reason for us to dwell on these different categories of Kobanot. Mitzvatan, their mitzvah, when it says the mitzvah is until dawn. Mitzvatan, zman achilatan, the time to eat them, is until when? Ad shi'ale amud ha'shachar, until dawn. 
And then at that point it becomes what's called notar, left over. You can't leave anything left over until the morning. And we learn them all out from the offering of the Tudah. So if it's true that every time the Chachamim say until midnight, you really have until dawn, so why did the Chachamim tell us until Chatzot? In terms of the Shema Israel and eating these sacrifices? In order to distance a person from Avirot. Rashi explains. You see Rashi, where am I? It's the last Rashi in the Mishnah. Vasum Bachila. And are, <coughs> they're prohibited in eating. The rabbis prohibited eating them. Kodem <coughs> Zmanan, before their time, Kadeshlo Yevolo Khlan Nachar Mudashaka. The rabbis made a, a, a cushion zone, a pillow, uh, that you can't eat them after midnight. Why? So that you wouldn't reach dawn. At that point in time, a person would be obligated in karet, uh, liable for karet. And also by kirat shema, lezarez et ha'adam shelo yomar yesh li od shahot uvetoch kach yale amud ashachar vavar lo azman. So a person won't say by shema yisrael, look, I have so many hours left until dawn. I have time. And then what happens? The, the, the dawn came, and you missed out on an opportunity to say shema yisrael. This next piece of Rashi is fascinating. Rashi writes here something. That if we're not going to discuss it today, we're going to discuss it at least next week. And this whole story of offering the fats that we mention here, our rabbis never prohibited us from that, those fats after chatzot. And the only reason it was even mentioned here in the first place it's only there to show you that anything that you do at night is really kasher until the whole night. But this is not a good example, says Rashi, of something where the rabbis say until chatzot, and really you have until the morning. <coughs> Our rabbis never said that by the fats the, that you have only until chatzot. They just say until the morning. But the, the Rabban Gamliel is trying to show you, no, anything you do at night is really until the morning. There's no such thing as something you could do at night that ends at midnight. That's what we learn in the second chapter of Megillah. The whole night is kasher, is, is permissible for the omer and the burning of the fats in the limbs. So Rashi here says this is not really a good example. This example of the fats until the morning, we use it only to show you the things that you can do at night, you can do till the morning. But it's not a classic case of where the rabbis say until midnight, and really you have until the following morning. Now this is true according to Rashi. The Rambam vehemently disagrees. We're going to see that, though, in just a few minutes. Right now it's almost 9.30. And they have a little bit of a... I have, I have a whole shiur prepared. We just read the Mishnah. I'm debating whether we should do that next week. Let's read the Mishnah again. And then next week we're going to take apart every single one of these words. Why me'ematai? Why that word? Why ba'aravin uh, in the evenings? Why not in the evening? Why every every question here? Why does it say from the time the kohanim come to eat tuma? What do you mean from the time the kohanim come to eat tuma? Everybody, everybody, nobody can eat tuma except for the kohanim. So why don't you say what when uh, people come to eat the tuma? If you say tuma, I know it's a kohen. The, every word here needs to be analyzed properly. I'm going to leave you off with a list of questions, but let's read the Mishnah again, so I can ask you those questions. Let's now do the Mishnah, knowing what Rashi told us in the back of our minds. From when do we read Shema in the evening? From when the Kohanim enter to eat their Terumah. Wants to write down some questions. I'm going to give you them as they come along. 
Me'ematai, from when? The Mishnah could have said, Ematai, or Matai. When do you read Shema in the evening? Me'ematai. It's an interesting word. Why does the Mishnah not first establish that you have an obligation to read Shema Yisrael in the first place? But why does the whole Talmud start with Shema Yisrael? What's going on here? Why This is the first thing you're going to talk about? In a Masechet called Berachot, you're going to talk about Shema? It says here, Ba'aravin, in the evenings. Why not Ba'erev, in the evening? Why not Ba'arvit, in the evening, like it says where? Open up a book of Mishnayot. In almost all the Mishnayot we have in front of us, it says, Ba'arvit, not Ba'aravin. Do you have a Mishnah over there? What did Mishnah say? Can you check? It says with a noon over there? Interesting. I'm using Rambam Girsah. Okay, no, it's good. That, that's good. If the Girsah matches what's in the Talmud, then I like it. But a lot of the Mishnah is Tab Barvit. Mishnah from the time that Kohanim Nechnasin Nechol Bitumatan. When the Kohanim enter to eat their Tumah. Here are my questions for you. The Kohanim enter to eat their Tumah. I just told you. Only Kohanim can eat Tumah. So why does the Mishnah tell us from when the Kohanim enter to eat their Tumah? Why not just when, when they enter to eat the Tumah? I know. If you say Tumah, I know who you're talking about. Question one. Why does the Mishnah use the word Kohanim? Question two. Why does the Mishnah not say from when the Kohanim eat their Tumah? It doesn't say when the Kohanim eat their Tehuma. It says, nichnasin. They enter. Enter from where? Where were they until now? Nichnasin. What is the meaning of the word Nichnasin? If you do yourself a favor, you'll write down these questions. And you're going to spend the next week thinking about all these questions. So you can come up with answers. And when they enter, where are they entering from? And why does it not just say when they eat their Tehuma? Bitumatan. In Hebrew, you would just write from when the Kohanim entered to eat tuma. When you come home to eat your dinner, you could just say, I come home to eat dinner. I don't say my dinner. Of course, it's my dinner. If I'm eating it, it's my dinner. Why does the Mishnah have to say bitumatan? Their tuma. I know it's their tuma. Who else is eating it? There. If they're eating it, it's theirs. Why? Ad sof hashmura rishonah until the end of the first watch. We're going to have to talk about what are watches. What does it mean, hashmura? What does it mishmeret? What's happening? What is that reference Rashi gave us to page three? If you want to look it up already, you can for for your homework till next week. Go look up the sugya on page three uh, a in the this this masachet masachet berachot daf three a. Divrei Rabbi Eliezer. These are the words of Rabbi Eliezer. Chamim say until min until chamim oim ad chatzot until midnight. Rabban Gamliel Omer. עד שיעלה עמוד השחר, until עמוד השחר. I want to throw in another question I didn't ask you before. What is the difference between Erev and Laila? Evening and nighttime. Why do Chachamim sometimes use the word Erev and sometimes they use the word Laila? Night and night. Why do Chachamim sometimes use the word Ben Ha Ben Hawad? Ben Hashemashot or Ben Ha Arbaim? Between the evenings. How many evenings are there in one evening? All of these are crucial to be able to understand the Mishnah so we can build a building on top of it. Here's a story that the children of Rabban Gamliel come from the Bet Hamishteh. What is the definition of Bet Hamishteh? Where else do we find in the Tanakh the use of these words Mishteh? Is Mishteh always going to be a wedding? Is it a time where there's alcohol? Is it, is it any kind of celebration? What is the real definition of Bet Hamishteh? 
Amuro, they ask him, Lo kalinu et Shema. We understand that question. We haven't read Shema yet. Meaning we missed the time for midnight. Can we still read Shema? Amar lehem, he tells them, Im lo ala amud ha-shachar, chayevin atem likrot. So long as the dawn has not begun, so you still are obligated to read. Veloza bilvad amur, and it's not all that they said. Ela kol ma shamu chachamim ad chatzot, mitzvatan ad shi'ale amud ha-shachar. Anything the Chachamim say until Chatzot, the mitzvah is up until dawn. Hekter chalavim ve'evarim mitzvatan ad she'ale amud ha-shachar. The offering of the fats and the limbs is until dawn. V'chol ha'nechalim liyom echad mitzvatan ad she'ale amud ha-shachar. And all those sacrifices you must eat in the same day are until dawn. Im ken lam amur chachamim ad Chatzot. So why did the rabbi specify only until Chatzot? K'day lahachik adam min ha'avera. To distance a person from the Avera. Maybe here I'll ask you one more question. I'm going to send you on a witch hunt, but it's there. You're going to find it. If you look well, you'll find it. So it's not really a witch hunt. You look for it. Rashi says, in the last piece of Rashi that we did, that Hekter Chalavim Ve'evarim is not a good example. Because the rabbis there didn't say you only have until midnight and... And really you have until the morning. The rabbis there never said anything about midnight. Rather they said, and he quotes from where? Masechet Megillah. Masechet Megillah, page Chaf Amud Bet, uh, 20b. You can go look up the Mishnah there too. Kol halayla kasher lekzirat haomer ulekter chalavim vevarim. The whole night you can sacrifice. Meaning, what kind of proof is that? In the, the Gemara tells us that you have the whole night to bring these uh, chalavim. So that's not a good example, says Rashi. I want you to look at the Gemara in Masechet Megillah on page 20b, as well as, as well as, go look up the Rambam. In the book Maaseh, in his, in his chapters on the Maaseh HaKormanot, the offering of sacrifices. And I want you to see what the Rambam says there. Does he agree with Rashi? And if he does not agree with Rashi, Who's the one that makes more sense? Is Rashi correct in invoking the Gemara on Megillah page 20? Saying that over there it says explicitly you have the whole night. The rabbi didn't say till midnight. Or is the Rambam correct when he writes what he writes? B'zalat Hashem, for tonight, those are the questions that I wish to leave you off with. Next week, B'zalat Hashem, we're going to come back together. And what we cannot do next week, next week we cannot repeat everything we did tonight. So the only way that next week's shi'u can make sense is if you, before next week, prepare this Mishnah well. Don't wait till tomorrow. You're going to forget it tomorrow. Sit down again with your Mishnah tonight, after the shi'u. Take 15 minutes. It won't take you a long time. It's a short Mishnah. And repeat this Mishnah with everything you heard tonight. If some, one of you wrote down questions and you're not too shy to either snap me a picture of it or send me a message with those questions, I'm more than happy to remind the rest of the people in the group what those questions are. Go look up those questions. Spend the next week thinking about this Mishnah and how much deeper this Mishnah can get. Once we're able to finish building this building before Rosh Hashanah, our next shiul after that is going to be to put aside everything to do with the technicalities of this Mishnah and go discover what I'd like to call the soul of the Mishnah. Let's go dig deep. Let's go uncover what's really hiding behind this Mishnah. But it will be irresponsible for us to put in the electrical wiring of a building without first building the building. And so we're doing what we need to do to own this Mishnah. Once we own this Mishnah, you and I are going to take it apart in ways not only so technical, but in ways so beautiful that I'm certain that none of us have ever done before. I'm looking forward to that next week, God willing.